Last month, the world was treated to a history-making billionaire space race. Perhaps each of them had some business interest, not so much in developing new space-worthy ships to service the needs of scientific research, but to begin to make it look like space tourism might one day be a thing. Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson each spent more than $5 billion of their corporate wealth to slip the surly bonds of Earth to just touch the lower edge of what might be called space. None of them actually orbited the Earth, but what they did amounted to basically a slingshot ride up and down in just a few moments so that they are now calling themselves astronauts. I didn't pay much attention to this contest that was part of uh, corporate advertisement and part adolescent adult ego competition. Certainly there were many who decried the financial waste and talked about what humani humanitarian projects could have been funded rather than waste $15 billion on these little trips. But I didn't really let myself pay much attention to that debate until Jeff Bezos in a tone-deaf shout-out from his post-flight conference, said, I want to thank every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer because you guys paid for all of this. And yes, on the one hand, what he said is obviously true. We did, but it's one of those truths that you might politely overlook until it is uttered aloud as if Bezos was proud of the fact. During these nightmarish months of the pandemic, Branson, Musk, but especially Bezos, have increased their wealth by billions and billions of dollars. The employees that Bezos gave a shout out to reportedly are sometimes forced to work shifts as long as 10 to 14 hours while wearing wristbands that measure their minute by minute productivity. They're not allowed access to their cell phones. They can be pat down at any moment by security guards to be sure they're not stealing anything. And some employees in Great Britain even reported that they worked in warehouses where the closest restroom was down four flights of stairs so that they were reportedly resorting to peeing into empty drink bottles to keep up their productivity quota so that they could hold on to their $15 an hour jobs. While Bezos spent $5 billion to spend 11 minutes in the quasi-space. Defenders of these billionaires in space say, well, it was their money. They can spend it however they want to. But hold on a minute. Is it their money? Or is it just a fluke in the way we structure employment and compensation in the Western world? When the ancient Hebrew prophet Isaiah spoke of the way that the world would be when the children of Israel escaped from their bondage in Babylon. He said of them, They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat of its fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. So can you hear the prophet asking us, how come everybody works in the vineyard, but only Bezos is getting to eat the fruit? Sure, it is legal for the owner of a business to set employment standards and salaries, but do you ever wonder who wrote those laws? Did the waiters, dishwashers, and cooks write those laws, or did business owners and investors write the laws that make exploiting the poor not only legal, but actually something that the wealthy can brag about? As Bezos basically says, how do all of you overworked and underpaid little people like watching me blast your profit sharing and pensions into space in 11 minutes? A local hip restaurant that's actually just about a mile from my home in Springfield also made national news last month. Several members of the staff of the aviary walked off the job recently 
in protest of what many have called slave working conditions. Where many restaurants have had to restrict the hours of business or even the number of days that they're open because they can't get enough employees, the managers at the aviary have come up with a workable solution. They just make their fewer employees work longer hours. Now, these are not ICU nurses in the middle of a pandemic. These are young people making dessert crepes and bringing you your bill neatly folded into an antique French children's book. They walked off the job demanding better pay, better working conditions and benefits, and they were, of course, immediately fired because there are no effective labor unions in this area, especially not in the food service arena. Rumor is that once the national media showed up to cover the demonstrations, that everyone at the restaurant who had not walked off the job did get a raise. But the employees who were fired for demonstrating were not rehired because, you know, power. Clearly, if they can afford to pay better now, they could have afforded it before. We don't have a labor shortage in America. We have a problem with wages that are lower than what it costs to live. We have an economic system that allows the rich to control the government. And right now, we are in a standoff between low-wage workers who are refusing to return to slave labor conditions and employers who would actually rather lose business in the short term than to give in to paying a living wage to their employees. Only organized labor can change this, especially in the food service arena. We have to give collective power to the poor to be able to stand up to the oligarchs who control the economy and the government. And yes, though we're rarely conscious of it, we all know, at least in the back of our minds, that all of those big corporations and all of those wealthy donors who donate to political campaigns in the millions are not making charitable contributions. They are buying legislation. They are buying tax policy. They are buying contracts for military manufacturing and building interstate highways and mass transit and infrastructure. You know that, but this week... I need to draw the distinction down to a very specific case of buying off the government because this one should be making all of America's blood boil. Over the past two decades, more than a half a million Americans have died from opioid overdoses. Millions more have suffered from addiction. The number one offender in this scenario is Purdue Pharma, They aggressively marketed their opioid pain relievers to doctors, lying repeatedly about how dangerous they were in addicting patients. Many of the people who were started by their doctor with the best of intentions on OxyContin when the legal supply ran out then turned to heroin heroin, with disastrous results. I have personally presided over the funeral for one such person, a delightful young woman who had back surgery, was prescribed OxyContin to manage the pain. When it became evident that she was addicted and demanding more of the medication, her physician cut her off. She went to the streets and bought heroin and very soon died of a overdose at the age of 42. This story has been repeated hundreds of thousands of times in the United States. You may have even seen uh, documentaries about the Sackler family and their Purdue Pharma. They clearly, knowingly pushed the sales of this dangerous drug and found ways to provide absurdly large amounts of the drug to very small cities that could not possibly have had a legitimate prescription for even 10% of the amount of drugs that they were sending to small-town pharmacies. But the family became obscenely wealthy as the opioid epidemic grew. When the news began to break about the corruption and deceit behind Purdue's meteoric profits, the family started moving large amounts of money into offshore accounts, hiding their wealth around the globe. On Wednesday of this week, it was announced that a federal judge had signed off on bankrupting the Purdue 
pharmacy company, but allowing the Sacklers to hold no legal responsibility because they made a $4.5 billion donation to a fund designed to help the affected families and to operate drug rehabilitation. In exchange for this amount of money, the Sacklers are admitting to no wrongdoing. They are protected from any future lawsuits from the millions of people who are the survivors and the affected people from this crisis. It reminded me of an old joke that, that has mistakenly been attributed to Groucho Marx. It was really penned by some obscure British journalist, but it sounds a lot better if you think of Groucho Marx saying it. Uh, Marx allegedly asked a woman, will you have sex with me for a million dollars? And the woman said that she would. Groucho asks, well, then would you have sex with me for five dollars? To which the woman shrieked, no, what kind of woman do you think I am? And he allegedly replied, well, we've already determined that. Now we're just haggling about the price. Do we have a justice system in America, or do we have a corrupt legal system that can be bought off? Apparently, we are so corrupt that you can kill a half a million people in the process of illegally making a fortune, and then you can buy your way out. The price that they haggled to was four and a half billion. We have no idea how many tens of billions of dollars the Stacklers have hidden around the globe. We may never know. They get to keep all of that money and escape prosecution. You know, just like they offer to every drug dealer on the street that sells crack. If you make a small donation to a local charity, you don't have to go to prison and you have no legal consequences. The United States, I am afraid to say, is no longer a democracy. We do not have a justice system. We are at the very best an oligarchy, but we are well on our way to having a fascist government in which the rich and powerful live in a world with no rules at all, and the rest of us can be sent to a prison work camp at the drop of a hat. If that doesn't make you mad as hell, then you either don't understand what we're losing or you are already so defeated that you no longer care. I keep banging this drum, but it's very hard to get laborers to wake up to what's being done to them. For the most part, in every wave of immigration in our country, employers have used cheap labor from waves of immigrants from Italy, from Ireland, from Germany, now from Central and South America, but they always try to get workers to blame the immigrant for their low salaries or their unemployment rather than the employers. I love this cartoon that so graphically illustrates how employers trick workers into thinking that their enemy is the poor immigrant who wants to take their job, when even without immigrants, employers are doing everything they can, legally and often illegally, to keep wages down and to keep unions from ever being organized. Let me repeat what this meme says so succinctly and clearly. No immigrant has taken your job. You were laid off by a capitalist who required cheap labor and took advantage of that immigrant to increase his profits, and nothing makes the employer happier than to hear you blaming the immigrant rather than the employer. You have reason to be angry, but not at the immigrant. I am not in the least sympathetic with the Make America Great Again crowd. I don't think you can look into America's past and find an ideal nation. We were born in the throes of slavery, engaged in pathological land theft through genocide of Native Americans, and taking farmland from Mexicans at gunpoint all followed with racial segregation and discrimination against women and minorities. America has never been a shining city on a hill, but I can tell you this. When I was born in 1956, the tax rate on the top income earners in America was 91% with a Republican president. When Eisenhower was president, the construction of our nation's infrastructure, including interstate highways, was underway and a person who worked a full-time, unskilled job could buy a house, a car, 
support a spouse and children, and retire at the age of 65 with financial security and dignity. The past 40 years have seen massive cuts on taxes levied on the most wealthy people and tax loopholes such that billionaire Warren Buffett observed in an interview a few years ago that he actually pays um, a tax rate of 17.7% while his support staff pays an average tax rate of 32.9%. That is, Warren Buffett's secretary pays twice as much in taxes per per dollar of income, as Buffett pays. We have corrupted our tax system and our political system so that the tax burden has been shifted off of the people that actually have money onto the shoulders of labor. America wasn't great in the 1950s, but in the post-war world of that time, we at least had a tax system that worked out so that we spread the wealth around the population in a much more equitable way while the super wealthy were not able to take joy rides into space, but kids like me did get to ride in the back of an old Ford to go to school in the morning. There are many issues that concern those of us who hope to see a more just society arising from our current chaos, but when it comes to economics, the classic labor union advice still holds. Tax the rich, support labor unions, and buy locally whenever you can.